All right, well, welcome everyone. It's so great to have all of you here. Um, my name is Megan Zagorski. I'm here from the C.C. Mellor Memorial Library in Edgewood. Um, and if you have made it to this meeting, um, you probably know what this is. This is a poetry reading um, featuring several wonderful local poets and a very special international poet. Um, so we are super excited to have everybody here with us today. Um, a quick little bit about um, the library to start out. Um, you know, the C.C. Mellor Library, we're located in Edgewood, Pennsylvania. Um, if you are local, we are open at the moment, so come on in and see us. We're open 12 to 6 every day except Sunday. Um, you can find out more information about us at our website, which is ccmellorlibrary.org. Um, but enough about that. Um, so I'm going to do a quick introduction of the folks who will be reading, and then we'll get to uh, the poetry. Uh, so reading with us today will be um, Judith Alexander Bryce of Pittsburgh, Charlie Bryce also of Pittsburgh, Jay Carson, um, also of Pittsburgh, Judith Robinson, also of Pittsburgh, and David Ades, not of Pittsburgh at all, of Australia. Um, and we will start off with Judy Bryce. Uh, so Judy Bryce is a retired Pittsburgh psychiatrist whose love of nature and experiences with illness inform much of her work. She's had over 80 poems published in journals and anthologies, including in the Golden Streetcar, VoxPopulosphere.com, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, the MagnoliaReview.com, and Annals of Internal Medicine, among others. Judy has twice received the Editor's Choice Award in the Allen Ginsberg Poetry Prize, sponsored by the Patterson Literary Review. And Judy is the author of Renditions in a Palette and Overhead from Longing and Imbibe the Air, which is forthcoming in January 2021. Um, so let's see if we can get Judy up here. Um, let's see. Okay, we'll unmute you. Oh, hang on. Let's see. We're having a little. Okay, there we go. Judy, take it away. Okay. Well, um, I would just like to thank everybody for coming and thank you, Megan for doing all the work you have to arrange this and, and work on, on behalf of the C.C. Mello Library. It's just fantastic what you and the library have done for us and for poetry, and we are incredibly grateful. So, um, and thanks again to everyone for coming. Um, and I gotta watch my watch or my husband will lose his temper with me. <laughs> so, um, anyway, um, so I'm, I just wanted to mention on top of that, that I just had a book, a chapbook accepted, um, and it's going to be coming out in January, right around the time that my book in by the air is coming out and it, it will be entitled shards of shadows, uh, a COVID diary, and it is published by a British publisher, uh, inspired and the publisher should be somewhere listening maybe anyway um i have um seven poems in all if i have time and i have three fall poems since it's fall here although i checked with david and it's not fall in the down under country of australia but um <laughs> three fall poems uh, one uh the first one is after robert frost uh his poem nothing gold can stay uh, and my poem is entitled, Love in the Afternoon. Today, the sun slid back behind the frost, between the darkening sallow roofs, and lost us to the errant eddies of late fall, her vermilion leaves swirling brown, brown swirling into a burnished gyre along an all-too-cold street of black, whose slick gray sidewalks slip smooth beneath the restive remnants of a month called fun, called Indian summer, called love in the afternoon. Today the wind woke us from our trance of spirit, of joy, perched atop the lady slippers, doting next to the daisies, whose white sheaths petal their suns as the breathed Breeze turned northerly, then mean, forever reminding us that dawn will ever go down today, and nothing gold, nothing good will stay. So that's my first poem. 
The next poem is entitled, No Grasp at Place. That night, the dark descended in dusking fall to glimpse dancing leaves hustled their way across the road, all caught by wind on their rustling route. And when I drove the familiar lane amid its asphalt rocks, its cragging potholes, the terrain captured me, spun my mind, its thought to an unknown sight, a forgotten spot. As when I awaken from a dream so clear a vision beside my love, in a nest, in a bed nestled warm with flannel sheets, soft, beckoning, entreating my soul to stay a bit, count the pillows, the poems on the wall, listen to the raindrops as they fall between the trees. And all the while the memories of yesterday retreat and go, vanish to a lost space, a time so gone that no amount of struggle, no grasp at place will remind of where I was or what has come before. My third poem is entitled, Just as Age. It is different now. The pinnacle of sun, its crescendo of heat and warmth, no longer with us, no longer here to slat through lassitude of clouds and days, their shades of pewter, soft, taciturn, with faint breeze off waves, off the flicker of aspen leaves, each twirling on a stem so fragile it almost breaks, but doesn't, won't. It is different now, the gilded rays so distant and askew, you can't find them to warm a saddened face, nor catch them in your hands before they vanish into chill into whorls of wind that force a blink of eyes, a scrunch of cheek, just as age and cold set in. So my next poem is quite a divergence from those three. It's all, it dates back to my childhood and uh, recounts my experiences in Filene's basement. Filene's was a huge department store in Boston, and Filene's basement was this huge basement at the below ground that sold everything, mostly clothes, <laughs> in these racks and racks and racks and racks of clothes. And there were very few people to help you. You just grabbed what you wanted and off the shelves that were kind of junky, uh, the shelves themselves. And you took what you wanted up to the cashier and and you could get like a wedding dress for ten dollars that was <laughs> worth a thousand dollars, for example. So this poem was spurred into action by another poet who wrote about Filene's basement. Her name was Yvonne Postel. So I start out with her name. Yvonne Postel too writes about Filene's basement. It's temptation the aisles and rows of clothes just to be sampled, mussed up, ruffled around, put back or not. But little does she know that Filene's was the very spot where I learned to shop, all on my own, without a mother saying yes, and no, don't touch that, that bikini, that bra, that sexy lingerie, so curiously tempting to the touch, to the thoughts, that wind a story in your mind as you finger the lacy underthings, those undies that are scant and there, but almost not. Mm -hmm. The filigreed stockings, black, with designs of stars and lines that might climb a young girl's leg to seduce a gaze from a stranger, handsome, lithe, and svelte across the racks. Those days by myself were the true adventure, following as they did the time with my mother's friend Rose, who led me on a buyer's trek when my mom was gone, perhaps indisposed. 
that very same friend about whom my mother had remarked needed to wear a girdle because of her oversize of rump, too big without one, too much of a waddle. Yet it was Rose who sashayed the aisles, rustled through the rumpled items, the seductive bargains, taught me how to really shop, explore such curious things, such depths of yearning, with offerings alive and sensuous, each and all ensconced in a singular enticing basement. So that's Filene's basement. <laughs> so now I'm gonna switch to three poems from my newest book, which is yet to come out, the, the chapbook um, entitled um, Shards of Shadows, which is in the making, but not there yet. And um, this poem is entitled, uh, and all of these poems are about living with COVID in one way or another. And the first poem takes off on the name Obad, which is really a, a, a poem. Um, it's a love poem. It's written in the morning or about a lovers in the morning. And so it's Obad, coronavirus, March 2020. And it's about finding out that uh, the infection is carried through those tiny minuscule droplets in the air. Obad, at daybreak, dim shadows, light piercing through faint riffle of muslin curtains, a tender second of calm to carry one single zephyr a whisper of wind, its blink, your soft and rocking voice. It was then I awoke to learn the news that buoyant in the breeze might be a particle, a tiny waft of crowning woe. In silence I trembled, grieved for hours. The next poem is entitled COVID-19 week four, a dream. I need to call my mother in Manhattan, visit her apartment on 85th and 3rd. I see the buildings and rivers that surround those busy avenues, north and south, congested skinny streets, east and west. It's a simple matter of going east, then cross the street, pass a bank, and take the elevator up. You'll arrive at full, wholesome family love, the best, the easy answers on how to live. I want to ask my mother how to navigate this deadly obstacle I can't even see. Yet when I telephone, I get her answering machine. The person whom you're trying to call is disconnected perhaps now living below the ground or up in heaven, if you can imagine her there cavorting with all the other dead. <laughs> no, I scream, you need to hear. I'm desperate for instructions, a direction to go. It's urgent, I repeat. I need to know how to, re how to retreat, hide from my life, my neighbors, how never to read the map of their faces or share with them my smile. So let's see, I have one or two more poems. I don't even know. Um, oh, just one, but it's a long one. So bear with me. So I'm a gardener and a flower gardener and this is a, a poem that's sort of like an ode, um, but it's entitled to my, garden, to my Garden in Time of COVID. Dear friend, I watch you now in gasp of early throes of fall, yet I see life around soundless, a pace laconic, slow. True, you still blaze, glow this start of autumn, even today, 
but the world has wavered this year, turned far too silent among us all. Your colors have flourished, a kaleidoscope this whole season long, from crocus bud to golden lily and dazzling purple spires of hosta. You've peacocked a panorama, waved your backdrop of fiddleheads, whispers of pampas grass, even my delicate ribbons of pink, which I'm sure have a better name, but for years my memory has danced with the hummingbirds, too fast started away. You've tugged my eyes, burst a new flower each day from a lifeless stem, and our rusty monarch flits for hours. Yet this last week, as summer's close has lowered heat to frost, I think forward towards bitter months to come. Wonder if we've seen our final flash of goldfinch or heard the last lone lilt of Oriole, its beckon from afar before frigid, unrepentant months of cold return. I know you'll be a different garden come this spring, marked by, marked by new perennials, some weakened flowers dying off. But even so, distraught questions ache my ambling thoughts. Will the monarch still flutter from one garden beyond and to the next? And who will be left to think of milkweed? Tend a garden, have the will to plant. So that's it, folks. Thank you very much for coming. It's a delight to uh, have you as an audience. And thanks again. To yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Judy, for that. That was really tremendously lovely. And let's see, who do we have up next? Next up is Charlie Bryce, uh, who is the author of Flash Cuts Out of Chaos. N Charlie, hey, you have to help me with this title. Nemes n Nemesinomy? <laughs> yeah, Nemesinomy's hand. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> An Accident of Blood and The Broad Grin of Eternity, which are all from Word Tech Editions. His poetry has been nominated for the Best of the Net Anthology and twice for a Pushcart Prize and has appeared in the Atlanta Review, The Sunlight Press, Chiron Review, Permafrost, Plain Songs, I-70 Review, Anti-Heroin Chic, and elsewhere. Uh, so Charlie, take it away. Well, thanks so much, Megan, and, and um, thanks to you and all you've done at the library. And I hope everyone goes to the C.C. Miller uh, website and clicks on that little donate button at the top because they could use it and they're the best library uh, on earth. So, and also thanks to everybody for coming. It's so nice to see you all. Really uh, is wonderful. So anyway, as you know, we've been uh, quarantined with the COVID situation. And uh, at the beginning of this, Judy was uh, out of commission and I was having to do all the cooking. Uh, the good news was that I lost 14 pounds trying to eat my uh, uh, cooking, my cuisine. Uh, the other good news is it certainly motivated Judy to get better fast. She's cooking now and I gained back all my 14 pounds. But anyhow, uh, I've been thinking a lot about food and I, I thought I'd begin with a little something from my, my book, An Accident of Blood, which is still available as all my books are, by the way. Um, so uh, from Word Tech, the, the greatest pu publishers around. This is called The First Time. What's his name, Luigi or Antonio or Emilio? who first threw garlic into olive oil? Did he slice it thin, inhale its pungent fragrance on his thumb and think, maybe a little oil? Did Maria or Beatrice or Sophia, one of his lovers, dip a soft digit into the mix, exude bliss, kiss his lips, prance the room, dance and swoon? Did they cross themselves, convinced that only God could have inspired this sensual potion, his gift in reparation for the nasty restrictions on Eve. And was it their little daughter, Rosalie, who, sassy and mischievous, smashed a tomato and threw it into the blend, causing her parents to kneel and thank the Blessed Virgin for the blossom on their tongues? 
But what if the first to chop sweet basil and sprinkle it on, a, on the jumble? Her name was Carmen or Adriana or Angelica, and she was Puccini's oldest ancestor. It was she who sang the first aria, a celebration of unlocked passions in the sauce. So while we're on a little surrealism in Italy, <laughs> uh, I started to think about, well, what might happen when the next Pope is uh, announced? Uh, good old Pope Frank, uh, you know, even though I'll, I am certainly not a believer, I think that guy's great. But anyway, um, so this tries to imagine the next, the next iteration of Peter. It's called Smoke. Blue smoke rose out of the Vatican chimney, then fireworks, big color-filled splashes in the sky. People crossed themselves. The clang of crucifixes against worn beads on rosaries pulled in panic from pockets was so loud that nuns donned earmuffs in July. A pilgrim convinced that his self-induced nocturnal emissions had caused this vaporous aberration, destroyed both Patelli on his penitent crawl across the sacred span of St. Peter's Square. The faithful were flummoxed. After the Pole, the German, and the dangerous Argentinian, they'd prayed for a return to calm, for the ascension of a simple man with a name like Giovanni, Paolo, Amadeo, or Giuseppe, who, uh, but now they quivered wide-eyed with terror as rockets soared, clearly a mysterium tremendum. What rough beast did these pyrotechnics portend? What prophecy propelled them? How vicious the new vicar's voice. I don't know what happened, Megan, but uh, the speaker, I don't see it. I don't see me. I just see Megan, but I don't know how it works. Anyhow. Um, oh, good. That's good. Everything's okay. <laughs> um, this, this next uh, poem, you know, we have the Me Too movement, but Me Too can also happen to Me Too. <laughs> and that's what this poem is about. It's called Sly Boots, and it was just published in I-70 Review. Sly Boots. I thought she had a rollicking, if indecorous, sense of humor. In the gym, she was a double wide in a sea of lean. On the treadmill next to me, she described the blowjob she'd provide if only I succumbed. She was oblivious of her husband, whom I liked, and my wife, whom I loved. She reminded me of Cordelia, the brainless babe on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, who thought that Marie Antoinette got a raw deal since she served her people cake. My blowy buddy had a son, 10 years old, willful, energetic, curious, whom she ignored during seductions. She promised one night to read him a story if he went to bed. Once he pulled the covers under his chin, she reneged. Too tired, she said. Your mother is very smart, the father told the son. You should know better than to trust her. The two, husband and wife, laughed while the boy wept in outrage. Today, 10 years later, in the paper, I read that the son has masterminded a fraudulent scheme. He's being arraigned as the apple while fall, who, while fallen, is still attached to the tree. Well, we have quite a situation uh, with uh, the orange person in the White House and the havoc he's created in our country. And um, this has to do with an incident that occurred uh, to a friend of mine whose initials are JS. It's called stupidity for JS. Once it strikes, little can be done. It's like a lightning bolt 
that leaves everything in its path scorched, bleak, and stunned. The guy in his MAGA cap yells at my friend that she's a scaremonger for wearing a mask while filling her car with gas. No matter that she had a triple bypass only months in the past, this ass knows best. Why do I need rhyme to describe this crime? It is kind of interesting to me that um, I guess the rhyming, I, I very rarely write in rhyme, but maybe it, it helps soothe that awful situation for me, not for her, unfortunately. Uh, now to change things completely around and actually talk about something kind of uh, beautiful, gorgeous and, and um, tranquil. Um, this is a poem called Blue Mind. I've, I've always been um, attached to the, to the sea, to the ocean. I just uh, love, love it. If I can get near the ocean, I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy. Uh, so this was just published in a journal called Flashes of Brilliance. <laughs> of course, yeah. Anyway, this is called Blue Mind. If infinity exists, it's in an ocean gaze. Blue mind, the scientists call it, where there's nothing but water and sky, where horizon is a hazy term, where hope is unimportant, as is yearning, sadness, or joy. Even love disappears into that blurry beyond of blue mind, of it's okay, of lost is the only sight on the map. So since we're talking about nice things, here's light is nice. I like light. I'm for light. I'm pro light. I would vote for light. Anyway, uh, this is a poem called Launched in Light. It was published just recently in Ink uh, pantry, but it's in my forthcoming book, The Broad Grin of Eternity, which will be out in March uh, from uh, Word Tech Editions. Launched in Light. Every morning I open the blinds as if posting the main on a sailboat. Like wind, a nothing that propels vessels along waterways. Light, another nothing I can't hold or touch or taste, fills our bedroom announces another day on our beleaguered, but still green planet. People argue over light, a series of waves, a gaggle of particles, waves and particles. It's contrast with afternoon shadow, heart beats a room, pushes particles of my life into an open face discovery, sends waves of warmth, through my biography. They say that night harbors mystery, but real mystery is launched in light. How does something not liquid pour onto a carpet or spread into a room like a celestial mantilla? How does a huddle of vibrating molecules force a smile or an invisible wave inspire a song. Here comes the sun, doo dee doo doo. <laughs> well, so I have two poems left and I'm getting, you know, to read with my favorite po poet, the one I happen to live with, which is a kind of a bonus, I would say. Um, and this is about our first little trip to France as a family with our son Ariel when he was <clears throat> 13. And uh, this poem is entitled, and these are initials, M-Y-W-I-F-E. Suitcases shifted wildly from one side of the bus to another. Ari and I grabbed what we could while we held onto the bus's crossbars and strap poles as if riding a roller coaster gone insane on cocaine or methamphetamine. The bus driver in Calais forgot that he was a bus driver. Instead, 
it incarnated Sterling Moss racing down gnarled streets of Monaco, mocking gravity at every turn. And what are those bags? I had two, Ari one, and someone with the initials M-Y-W-I-F-E had brought along on this our first foray as a family to France, seven large travel bags that Ari and I had to chase while they slid up and down the bus aisle like hyperactive children on sugar highs. Seven bags of absolutely essential stuff that made my son and I commemorate the martyrdom of St. Joan of Arc on that smoky day in May 1431. Never, no one should ever accuse me of not being essentially religious, you know. Actually, you could accuse me of not being, anyway. So this is my last poem, and uh, it's called, What If You Slept? And it's after um, a poem called, What If You Slept? by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. What if you, what if you slept? and your mother was smiling and kind, reading books, sampling strawberries, her favorite fruit, and packing picnics, which she always wanted to do had it not been for Bud Budweiser and your father. And your father was singing as he did in the morning, thanks for the memories and blue skies, and was sober and fighting trim and you were playing catch with your son when he was eight, kickball when he was 10, watching him zigzag down a double black diamond at 17, holding his carefully crafted cups and bowls in his 20s, watching the pirates play the Dodgers together in his 40s. And Judy's long midnight hair hangs on her shoulders and her doe eyes glitter in their seductive and irresistible ways, and she takes your hand and you dance with her atop her lilting verses, and stars explode, planets spiral through space, vaporizing vapors, dissolving black holes, revising your time, revising your time on this earthly cyst into an eternal remonstration of redemption, wrapping you in a celestial blanket of bliss. And you hear the English horn's calm call that, that belongs to Dvorak's Largo theme. And you stand, hands outstretched to life. And it's then that you understand that you died while you slept. Thank you, everybody. It was wonderful to see you all and to read with you. Well, thank you, Charlie. That was a real treat. Uh, next up, we have uh, Jay Carson, who holds a doctorate in rhetoric from Carnegie Mellon University. He taught for many years at Robert Morris University, where he was a founding advisor to the literary magazine Rune. He has published more than 100 poems in local and national journals, magazines, and collections. He is also the author of Irish Coffee from Coat Hill Press and The Cinnamon of Desire from Main Street Rag. Jay considers his poetry Appalachian, accessible, the ongoing problem solving of a turbulent youth, and just what you might need. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, see, let's get Jay up here. All right. Oh, hang on, Jay, one moment. You're still muted here. Okay. Okay, there you go. You're ready. Thank you, Megan, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Megan, for organ helping to organize this, and Charlie, uh, you did a fabulous job of organizing this. I'm, I'm very grateful to be included with such distinguished poets, such great poets. Um, you guys are terrific. As I said to Charlie when he told me the, uh, the lineup, I said, how do you fo follow Charlie? So what's he do? He makes me follow Charlie and Judy. <laughs> you guys were terrific. Okay, I have uh, uh, some new stuff here today, uh, tonight. 
Um, I was going to start off with a COVID poem, uh, but I thought that was too depressing. So I'm going to start off with a uh, suicide poem. <laughs> since, since if we catch it, our chances of survival are unclear. Joe and I were teasing about suicide the other day, whether either of us would do it. How awful for the children and spouse. How to do it neatly. How to use pills, not be too scared of heights to make a botch of it. I recalled a friend I met on a long trip. Roberta told me she was a widow because her husband killed himself on the second attempt. The first time, he missed something vital and was miraculously saved, but wheelchair bound. She told her children she was not going to refit their house with ramps and other equipment because, Roberta said, he would just do it again when he could, and he did. But I have another story of a friend who shot himself over a kitchen drain board to minimize the mess. His whole family still does a special service with his favorite berry pie on his birthday. I'm told we don't dread heights because we fear we'll fall. We're deathly afraid we'll jump. This uh, next poem was um, uh, I entitled Confessions of a Time Traveler until I showed it to um, a number of poets who said, that's the worst title I've ever heard. <laughs> so I've changed it now and the title is now Praying. I'm a fair weather Anglican who only occasionally thanks God for the Chilean sea bass or soul tearing sunset over Cartagena. I appreciate every moment of my first class upgrade on Cathay Dragon Airlines. Loving God's gifts, isn't that a form of prayer? But when the stomach goes bilious or my feet to slush, I fervently ask for help. I know seriously spiritual people think this is childish heresy, but they are good people often getting better. I'm getting worse, older and more fearful. You can laugh at me, but wait till you open the last quarter of your amputated century and a flight of 20 stairs becomes a terrible trudge. Say to the top of the Gaudi Cathedral, the magnificent skyline of Barcelona, makes it almost worthwhile until you realize that all the immortal edifices were created by men like you, not just aging, but dying, while the sea and distant mountains continue to look on with indifference. Thought we might need a little change up here. <laughs> so, um, this next one is called uh, contemplation. All food is 80% water, a doctor told me once. When you think about it, it has to be. I thought about it. I didn't think it had to be. I'm a theological libertarian. God could do anything she wanted. All food could be like jello. That might be a better plan for no toast stuck in the throat, if you think about it. I had a smarty girlfriend who used the same phrase like, Marriage is the most logical manner of living for humans, if you think about it. I thought about it. I didn't think it had to be. I live single and alone now. Uh, I did a couple of daddy poems here. Uh, one's a couple of years old, actually. I came across it in my uh, uh, files and uh, a newer one. This first one's called Locks. I sleep near my father's hair curling next to my bed on a shelf, his soft four fingers of silky blonde in a gray box, now broken, still showing a small but distinctive crest as if for the Pittsburgh noble he never became. His parents took more from him than that grasp of hair, hothousing him in the child purgatory of the Monongahela House Hotel, his mother dying early, his father mourning, obliterating, all but his merchant tailor business. My father's childhood was briefly saved by his grandmother's farm, idealized in his telling of sweet lettuce patches, cucumber sandwiches, a gardener who blew the foam off his reward beer in the face of a cat named William Howard Taft. His mother's brief vitality, cancer growing slower than the spring radishes, 
and they left him less, an eternal thirst for love and whiskey, a rage at injustices done to him, and some irreplaceable memories. My father's hair is tied by a small piece of string so I can touch the ancient and loving oils of my grandmother's hands. The string is as dried now as worn out compassion that that won't crack or blow away. And this is the second more modern one. I have always lived within the sound of the Pennsylvania Railroad which moans, then sings, and rides me at night to the sound of my father's voice, trembling at the trains he knew and those he rode in childhood and growing and passing. The ones to meet his father in Cape May or to carry a gift to my mother in New Mexico or to come and lift my brother and newborn me in California. He'd given up the car for good in the Sonora Desert, simply at the urging of a billboard showing cool, happy people in sleek, frosty-looking Santa Fe cars. Next time, take the train. Sometimes Santa Fe, Super Chief, and Dad crossed America just for the hell of it. He'd worked hard sweat labor in a roundhouse repair shop summers in college, although he didn't need a dime. Orphaned, he lived financially easy, emotionally hard, eased by the trains, he knew the diesel roads, the steam numbers, even old 97 and 143, the FFV serving the first families of Virginia. His voice would catch at the sighing steam of the Pittsburgher leaving for New York, or telling my 14-year-old self how to change trains in Chicago and catch the Panama Limited to New Orleans to, and order the gravy grits in the dining car. My father and I coupled to New York's Pennsylvania Station, Pennsylvania side, first as a family, then just us. But I had the pass to my brother and miss traveling to Paris to ride the Très Grand Vitesse to Nice. My brother said it cost him 10 years, which must have transubstantiated to my dad's delighted grin. My father did many fine things for me, taught me driving wheel morals, beautiful language, and how to build a flagman's sense for trouble and a lineman's backbone for hard times. But I must admit that on hearing the keening of the Pensy Main Line highball as we packed Dad into the final black carriage, I found myself humming Hobo Bill's Last Ride. So another little change up here. The name of this is att uh, Attention. It might easily be called Lack Of, um, attention, uh, and starts with a quote, which is a fragment. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the reason that all European intellectuals ever since have either been existentialists or communists. I've been looking for the first part of that sentence ever since I woke up in that class. Everybody I knew in the class, either cut or like me, didn't pay attention. It's happened more than once. Blank is the most important writer of the century. Blank is the only way we can save the economy. It wasn't the planet. I finally did read the first part of The Sun Also Rises enough, three times, to find out that Jake Barnes had an accident in the war that made him impotent. He wasn't just being coy with Lady Brett. I'd like to hear your thoughts on paying attention, but I'd probably miss the first half of them. So, like Jesus said, save the something or other for last. I'm in a pretty good spot now in my life. I'm, uh, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, but uh, it, there was a time when I wasn't. And one of the things that kept me going in that time was uh, models. Um, and this is my first and enduring uh, model, uh, Gilbert. This poem is called Gil's Song. He was what I wanted to be long before I knew it. Successful student, lawyer, musician, motorcycle dude. More than all those, Gil's was a, Gil was a freedom rider. Almost run off a bridge by swerving vengeful KKK while he tried to get the vote to those who had none. Later, 
revitalizing scores of rivers with his friend, Interior Secretary Stu Udall. It goes without saying I was none of the above. The damnedest thing, the infuriating thing, is he cared so much about me. We'd grown up together, friends since five. I made him swear then that we'd meet at 21 and sell pieces of jelly licorice on toothpicks and make our millions. Even then, I sensed Gil liked me and only humored my plan. We invented a game of bar tag in his backyard monkey bars, one of my wins because of my slick nylon jacket. Later, if I drove past in a new ritzy car with a new glitzy girlfriend, he still invited me to his string band's benefit for revitalizing our local river. He opened a high-rise law firm, successful enough to support his considerable storefront help of indigent natives and aching earth, saving grassland and repairing wetland. I slid as easy with my nylon jacket to jobs that were too little thinking and too much cocktail. But I was still somehow relieved and infused when we met and he tried to teach me, maybe with how to see and study birds or showing me how too many untended cattle destroy a small stream or what a good senator or governor can mean. When we were 12, I almost broke his arm in horseplay or maybe from, in preventing him from doing what I already knew he would. Weeks before his death, Gil, inexplicably, and of course, draped that arm around me. And I think I'd like to finish with a poem called Ashes of Love. Uh, this is uh, the, it's taken from uh, the great old bluegrass song by Johnny and Jack, for those of you who might know that kind of music and those guys. Ashes of Love is the song I was humming this Good Friday morning. That old bluegrass tune my cousin taught me way before he developed dementia and forgot how to take his medicine. He was laid out last month at Copeland's funeral home, where I'm dressing to go now. This time to see the waxy remains of my friend Roger, open casketed there. Heard he looks like hell. I was recently in the Holy Land, as I learned to call it. Now the death, not yet the rule among my friends, is no longer the exception. With other ancients, I walked to Via Della Rosa, placed a pleading note in the Wailing Wall, and sailed a boat on the Nile, wondering how to age so long and well. My elder men friends and I sport worn out faces. Miracle medals replace our bones, some heroes and with now in wheelchairs rolling towards an end. I have the promise of the upstart Nazarene of more than the elaborate headstone my legal will demands. But will I have love beyond these last words? Thank you guys. And thank you, Jay. That was really, really something. Um, so next up, we are going to have Judy Robinson. Uh, Judith Robinson is an editor, teacher, fiction writer, poet, and visual artist. A graduate of the University of Pittsburgh, she is listed in the Directory of American Poets and Writers. She has published more than 75 poems, five poetry collections, one fiction collection, one novel, and edited or co-edited 11 poetry collections. Robinson teaches at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Carnegie Mellon University and at the University of Pittsburgh. So let me bring her video up here one moment. All right, uh, G, you are ready to go. Okay, thank you so much, Megan. And thank you all distinguished poets who have joined me tonight. I'm uh, honored to be among you. Thank you so much. And very, very special hello to lots of friends in New York and Canada and all over. Thank you for tuning in. All right. I'm going to start with a few new pieces, uh, brand new poems. This is called Colors. White for stately homes 
in London and Charleston, the flag of surrender. Pink for dimpled cheeks and other soft items that harden then disappear. Glaucous purple blossoms, wounds of the elderly that never heal. Gray the steady march from presence to absence, the go going until gone. Love is sought in every season, desperate the pool of its scarlet patina. For this much can be missed, mauve, ecru, lemon, beige, the subtle blushes, the washes, blends, and hues. This is another new poem called Mary Lou, Last Summer. Heat rules, burns everything green, curls to rust. Sun presses down, a simpering smile button. The dejected landscape consorts with her bitterness. At night, banjo Ted, a little wine, soiled linens. Hours pass somehow until the heavy breath he exhales raises Swedish bile, chokes her throat. Midnight, desperation, she runs. He tries, but does not catch her. Hammering away on the clubs, the gyms, the ship's locked doors. The song he writes, Last Summer, weaves the story his way. Heroism, his twangy theme, a simple three-chord strum. This is uh, this was my uh, um, um, pushcart prize nomination poem. It's called Feed Lots. With thanks to Blue Unicorn pub Publisher, Feed Lots. My head is clamorous with mourning. Before me, crowds are trampling the pathways. Up for breakfast, they rush to feed at counters and tables. True, at night they lust to dance, to play, to curl beneath bed covers, by day to decorate and embrace themselves. True, some will remember a moment of trout shared at a windswept lake in summer, a kindly word, a promise. If once happy feeding, they will nod, smile, and choose a rounded spoon. If starved, take care they will find the sharpest knife. This is the title poem of my last book, Carousel, and it's called Carousel. I who want speed, tumble and crash, struggle to right myself. Ponies bow down, ivory teeth bared, nostrils spread wide. I roll to my left, creep to my knees, Ponies spin on, edges blend and blur. Angels and cherubs watch my body go down again and again. Ponies rear back, painted hoofs rise, blank eyes stare. Full circle mechanics fuel whistles and horns, plexiglass hearts. Wounds will heal, swellings recede, scars will be pink but not pretty. Unlikely roses, roses as bruises on limbs and on lips, and ponies spin on. This is another new poem called Counting. When I imagine time, or my age, or almost any amount of anything, I see numbers on blue lined, grainy first grade paper. Penciled columns in tens, from one to 79 on the front, the 80s, 90s, and the very important 100 on the back. They say we make these cerebral connections. So here you are with me again, more than three quarters of the way across the front page. There are still small, chippy flecks in the cheap paper just as before, 
when we were still far over on the left side of the page. Well, every column that came in between has passed, all of it, our lives in common and not, so much and so little embedded in those wavy columns. Soon, my love, still counting, we must face the matter of turning the page. This is called Urbanity, and this won an award from the writer's place. Urbanity, how to tolerate crowds of human strangers, all those bodies that sweat and push and displace space and air and seats on buses or clog the roadways. I don't mean robbers, rapists, or molesters or anything like that. I mean the strangers who load up on wine in restaurants and scream their shrill heads off when you're trying to eat. The ones who smell lousy that you have to wait behind in long lines at the store. The ones who run red lights and cut you off in traffic. And what about all the pretending that goes on? One honest curmudgeon said, hell is other people but few will admit that is the truth, nor will most admit a reasonable preference for dogs. I get to, I get to be a little sour sometimes. <laughs> this is called Buy a Ticket. An old diminished town, broken streets, broken glass. Walls here are layered, many coats of paint all peeling. Flakes of rust glom onto any metal. The salt does this. A lone surprise admits the grit. A chrome bright gym open 24 seven for the afflicted, the jobless, wounded, welfarians who nagging its scabs cannot sleep. Someone says dance, someone says hope, someone says Walmart is coming. Someone says try this, it'll take off the edge. No one on the other side knows squat, but of one truth, the pounded, bruised, lacerated are certain. Money would make everybody happy. Another curmudgeon poem. This is called Wishing for Carson Street. This is for Weldon Keys and Woody Allen after reading something called Poe Ecology Magazine. Night in a country field hissing bugs, the sky pockmarked with stars, ugly bright spilled beans that glare and sting and oppress my eyes. Makes me wish for curbs and city lights, cement and storefronts, men with tattooed bodies and strutting girls, their boozy songs, their dirty street, their blah, blah, blah. This is called The Aegean Embraces Apollonia. Yearning comes, a wide roaring tide, the Aegean advancing, blue invading the pure white beach, salt aching to consume sugar. There is a contradance going on, tide and sand, pool, resist, resist, pool cycle after cycle of play, and time seems to play a part, as does wind, bird, and sun. How much will be taken, how much surrendered, before the shimmering hours are gone? This is a Father's Day poem. It's called Father's Day Poem for my dad. My father smoked camels, two packs a day, he wore a fedora, worked like crazy, and believed he was lucky, that his life was better than his father's. They're not as hard on the Jews now, I heard him tell my Uncle Dave many times. Actually, they discussed how good or bad things were for the Jews for 40 years, and who the enemies were, which ones were worse than the others, and the pirates, the poor pirates always in the cellar, year after year. 
Uh, this poem is in commemoration of the shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue, which is, we're coming upon the second uh, commemorative, uh, uh, October 27th will be two years. And I have a special thank you to Judy Bryce, who read this in my, on my behalf at that time when I couldn't do it. Thank you again, Judy Bryce. This is called Ailey Ailey. Eleven tolling orchestral bells as Elgar tries with eloquence to grieve like a Jew. But the cello cries out, O oh God, not again, as I do each new year for Akiva, for Masada, for the executed piled deep in pits at Belarus and Rawa Ruska, for Helm Lilo, for Tells, for the hundreds of Shtetls, for Sobibor, for Belzec, for the dozens of camps. My people incinerated ghosts, ash in the soil of Europe. O oh God, now for Pittsburgh, my city in America for friends I knew, the freshest blood, for the Rosenthal boys, for the other innocents, the 11 souls praying in the synagogue, for the 11 new dead. And of course, Jewish people are certainly not the only people who have suffered and continue to suffer in the last century and even today. So this is a poem for them. This is called Bitter Rain. This day could surely use some wetting down. The rain gods are trying, they should. Dank as hell on Devonshire, red oaks made over, a black labyrinth netting the old mansions. They are trying hard to make rain, they should. This day, a Polish lady, tiny, dagger-eyed, shrill, remembered her long past youth when she threw rock-filled snowballs at wounded German prisoners on parade at last in frozen, rubbled Krakow. As the iron clouds burst, reporting how the Krauts bled, what she screamed, this is for my father, this is for my sister, this is for my Warsaw. Rain comes, nothing washes away. So uh, my last poem, I thought I'd try to lighten up because we have to try to have humor and goodwill and all those positive things. So this is called Hawaiian Night. The singles won't mingle quite yet. The used to be boys cluster in corners, the tall and the short clutching pina coladas, laugh out loud over nothing as the ladies lit up by torches chatter and flutter hens among palms this here's the days in party room exhorts the bald dj so get up and dance do they wish to be here most of them must so much has ended yet something remains hearts scabbed over our hearts just the same Thank you. Well, thank you, Judy. That was really quite moving. Um, and our next poet, uh, and our last poet for the evening, and our most special guest is uh, David Ades, who is a widely published poet and stor short story writer with publications in Australia, the US, Israel, India, England, Romania, and New Zealand. He is the author of Mapping the World, A Float in Light, and the chapbook Only the Questions Are Eternal. In association with West Words, David is the curator of the Poets Corner, Poets Corner Reading and Now Podcast series in Western Sydney. David's poems have been read on the Australian radio poem program Poetica and the U.S. radio program Prosody. David's poetry has been nominated twice for a Pushcart Prize, has won the University of Canberra's Vice Chancellor's International Poetry Prize, and has been shortlisted twice for the Newcastle Poetry Prize. 
His poems have been highly commended in the Bruce Daw National Poetry Prize, a finalist in the Dora and Alexander Rains Poetry Prize in the US and commended for the Reuben Rose International Poetry Prize in Israel. Um, and we are so delighted to have him as our very special internet our international guest. Uh, so David, you are all set. Oh, hang on one moment. You're, you're muted. Let me, uh, okay, try now. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. I'm delighted to be here and I'd like to thank you, Megan, for setting this up in the CCML library, which I did uh, visit a few times when I was living in Pittsburgh for five years between 2011 and 2016. Uh, it's a great thrill for me to be reading with my friends, my poet friends, Judy and Jay and Judy and Charlie. Thank you, Charlie, so much for inviting me. Um, and before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the Wallamidu people who are the uh, traditional custodians of the land from which I will be reading and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to acknowledge also that their land has never been given up or ceded. I'd like to start with a poem that uh, was first published about uh, 25 years ago. It's an old poem, um, but it seems apt. Uh, we're all, all in this arc of the planet together and we need to look after one another. And, um, I'd like to dedicate this to um, everyone who has lost someone in this very traumatic year. Holes in the net. There are holes in the net of my father's generation. And as they widen, dimness, dimness envelops the stars in my firmament. I have been a much loved child. They to me, backbone, rock and anchor. I have been nurtured from every quarter. They to me, generous benefactors. What have they not given that was within their power? They have been shield and sword on my account. I to them, an unfinished poem of their dreaming. They are failing now, one by one, old age and illness claiming them. Their eyes are turning inward to other skies. There are holes in the net of my father's generation. And as they widen, I can see in my firmament, my own, my own mortality beginning to glow. Um, the next poem is a poem I wrote before Trump but you wouldn't know it, it seems apt. It's been published recently by um, Michael Sims in Vox Populi. And uh, there is a little um, acknowledgement here to Emily Dickinson and her line, tell the truth, but tell it slant. Extracts from a liar's notebook. If you tell the lie, tell it slant, but with a direct gaze, with utter conviction, tell it as if you believe it is truth again and again and in the telling watch it transform watch it become truth become certainty immutable as if it were never other and in this way fool most of the world save those nearest ones who taste the lie who feel it in their guts who tremble wounded diminished whose love wavers becomes muddied conflicted and then tell yourself another lie in the same way, justifying the first if it is not yet truth, if any doubt lingers. So you become blind to the damage you have wrought, the damage you will repeat, the devastation all around you. Um, like most poets, I try and write my truths, however uh, imprecise that might be. And uh, I suppose it's not unusual in these days for my truth to have a sense of foreboding about it. Um, this poem was inspired originally by the now 70 million stateless people around the world whose lives are not their own almost. Um, the storm's dark edge. There is nothing to be seen in the sky. White. An unpainted canvas, it keeps its secrets to itself. Notice though the wind's fierceness, the waves already crashing upon the rocks at the foot of the lighthouse. Come night, we will watch the light's beams disappear into darkness. We will hear the gathering howl. Our skin tingles already, presaging 
heaviness brewing in the air, imprinting itself upon us. The children, whimpering, feel it too. It's in the air they breathe, an undefined agitation making them restless, their sleep troubled. They raise their voices against it, against each other, the evaporated calm. Every semblance of the lives we have led is about to vanish. Forces too strong to counter have propelled us here, here where the hungry mouth of the unknown awaits, here where the blustering winds of whim and chance surround us here at the storm's dark edge, where we invoke hope, where we pray for mercy in an unmerciful world. And strangely enough, um, this was also published by uh, Michael in Vox Populi and, and was written well before COVID. Um, it's called Contagion. Insidious. It swept, up, it swept up in its camouflage of white noise, one strident proclaiming step at a time. Its knee jerk shoot from the hip scatter gun playing loose with facts, short attention span sprays, provoking dismissal, though not without qualms. Danger often lies like an unsprung trap, heedless of its quarry. Not Marburg or Ebola or Hantavirus, not bird flu or Lassa virus or Junin virus, not Crimea Congo fever virus or Machupo or Kayasanua forest virus, not dengue fever or Zika, but just as complex, just as unsubtle. I have encountered it before when it was more constrained, skulking around in backwaters before it ratcheted up its virulence. It comes now hedra-like, unstoppable, morphing by the moment, ebullient, caught up in its withering sweep, its rapid fire fling of complaints and accusations, its hunger for attention, its frenzied neediness. Smallness has such a big mouth, such an endless appetite, so much trouble digesting, and still it wants. It wants, it wants to eat us all. I, I, I have a bleeding heart. So this is for those of us with such things. We of the bleeding hearts. We of the bleeding hearts tend our little fires in the encroaching dark as we have always done, as we will always do. Even as we recognize less and less in the world, even as the wolves circle closer, bearing their teeth snarling. We cannot help ourselves. We sing the songs within us, the prayers, the incantations. We whisper our hopes, the dreams we will not relinquish. Our hands reaching out to touch the wolves' beautiful coats. <laughs> I wrote a lot of poems when I was in Pittsburgh. Um, and I read a couple of Sydney inspired poems. The late afternoon lies languid. The late afternoon lies languid on its beach of clouds. There is honey in the breeze, a rumor of rain, and the ocean of night has not yet found its harbor. I think of bees by their absence, of what will happen when they find secret homes for their hives, their honeycombs, when their buzz departs the world. I remember walking through a cornfield in Myanmar, captivated by the ancient temples of Pagan, not hearing the buzz around my ears until the sting, the sting, the sting, and how I ran screaming, my hands and arms aflame, running in fear from the bees, I wish to hear again as the late afternoon lies languid on its beach of clouds. We are all in this together and yet um, I get the sense in this generation that no one is paying much attention to anybody else and that everyone's in their bubble, heightened if you like by lockdowns and coronavirus. Everyone's in their own little world and 
perhaps we're all in a way invisible to one another. This, this poem speaks to that. Some days seem more ephemeral than others. Some days seem more ephemeral than others, translucent, filled with speech no one listens to, or absences, or gray shawls. And you flicker through them, brittle as an old movie reel, from scene to unseen, from scene to unseen, mostly unseen, inhabiting the, ne the negative space of yourself, which you will fall into altogether one day, like people around you have been doing for years, only you seem to be noticing it more now, all those lemmings dropping over a cliff, and the cliff getting closer, you feel it. But at this minute, you don't know whether to push back against the ephemeral, shout something, make a statement, drop a jug of water, strip naked, cajole the gaze of eyes, however momentary, because you are still here, even if no one is paying attention. So immersed are they in their own incarnations of visibility. Or whether you should just lean into it as you would a lover. Take the gift of being unnoticed and slip away into rarefied atmosphere. Wispy white contrail trailing behind you, marking the passage no one saw. I'd like to um, thank those of you who have stayed until the very end, until me. Um, thank you very much. And shout out to my friends in Sacramento, in Pittsburgh, in Tasmania, who are here with me. There in the dunes. There in, in the dunes, I pitched my tent among strands of reeds in the sea's night speech. And there on a dried out creek bed in the desert, the night sky cupping the world, parading its way, wares. And there on an island where winds unleash themselves and lighthouses warned of rocks. And there on a path in a gorge where rock walls towered, where kangaroo feet drummed through sleep. And there in your heart, I pitched my tent. I breathed your presence. I fell asleep there and woke again. Some part of me remaining, some part of me once more moving on. I had this experience, uh, I traveled for a number of years, um, had this experience when Yugoslavia was Yugoslavia, so a long time ago. Disembarking. Disembarking the train near midnight, the day's slow map crawl rolls away, thunder's long receding rumble. A small contained world seeds to open sky, stretch of muscles, a surfeit of air. Five miles from the Yugoslav Greek border, I enter the night on foot with a just met Cypriot born New Zealander. I have no premonition of the war to come. A full moon is reflected and reflected by the side of the road. Mosquitoes fill the dark. The shimmering lights of the border crossing are a bright caterpillar on a ridge. I recite from the Axion Esti. In the beginning, the light and the first hour. And here the words return in Greek, hovering in the air. Poetry infusing the night with its presence. Two of us conjuring Odysseus Elitus, his voice resonating with our footsteps, oblivious to all borders. And this is a, another Sydney poem when I first came back here and found myself immersed in family, as many of us are, and getting lost in that. Every now and then we have to come up for air. Hidden from my view. Today is a wetly new day, the heat of recent days having broken, a thirsty sky having turned on its tap and forgotten to turn it off, whilst bustling white cockatoos flap loud and low, screech their pterodactyl scrawl above the drenched urban lawns the glistening, orderly trees. Amid the constant drip and trickle, I have sloughed off all the skins of my former selves, gone like shadows in the dark, and stand naked, feather light, my body familiar, a stranger wearing it. Where did I go in the cacophony of family life? And who is this now 
in a suddenly empty house strewn with the tailings of other lives. I want to hear the poetry of the almost silence I once thought cleaved to me like a lonely ghost. I once thought I'd had too much of. Just as all the paths I took took me far from the path I thought I was taking. For years, I wanted to compromise my long solitude. I wanted unknown territory until it became too much so, until I no longer recognised myself, the life I had led myself into with no prospect of retreat, the life that has gone on vacation for a few days, leaving me with my nakedness, a window to prize myself open, to see if I have become empty in the giving, or if something wild and hungry is growing, untended, unkempt, hidden from my view. Uh, I've got two more poems. Both of them are a little bit, I suppose, elegiac. Um, not going to finish up on a up, terribly upbeat note, but uh, I wanted to share these with you. Something is always arriving at its end. Something is always arriving at its end. This breath and the next and the next. I wonder now each time I see you, each time I speak to you, if it will be the last. I wonder if something lies beyond each end, if what has finished continues a secret life in another realm, if the last time I see you in this realm is not the last time I see you. Now I am making a mountain of endings in order to climb it, to look from its summit upon what I have never seen before, spread out before me in every direction, coming to my own end with eyes open, not wanting to miss it, not wanting to miss anything. And my last poem, fittingly, there at the last. There at the last, after the wine, the champagne, after the clinking glasses, the toasts, the merry interchange of voices, the sky darkens. One after another slips away, following secret paths to where each alone must go. The noise diminishes, save for the sea's restless roar, the wind's gusty breaths, the sound of every word being unspoken, every promise annulled. And behind you, the great shadow of every grief is set free, departing like a hold balloon. And you are both weight and lightness together, waiting on the shore where the boat will come. There at the last, when there is no one but you. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for that really, really lovely work here. Um, let me bring my video up here. Okay, uh, and thank you, yeah, thank you for David, our very special international guest, for joining us um, all the way from the future in Australia across the international dateline. And uh, thank you for our, to our local poets, uh, Judy and Charlie and Judy and Jay. Um, we are always so so uh, lucky to hear your work um, and have you share that with us. Um, and thank you to everyone who has come and joined us this evening. Um, you know, we've got a bunch of folks here in the Zoom meeting, and we have a bunch of folks who are watching um, live on Facebook as well. Um, you know, you've left such such lovely comments. I hope everyone who's reading, who read tonight, is is able to read those comments. Um, we've got some some very appreciative folks there. Um, and if you are, well, if you're here, you're a poetry type. And if you are a poetry type, you may like our upcoming event on Saturday. We we are having a reading for the Squirrel Hill Poetry Workshop. Um, so you can register for that the same way that you registered for this uh, through Eventbrite. If you've got any questions, shoot me an email. Happy to talk to you about that. Um, and uh, this recording will be posted on YouTube uh, of the C.C. Meller Library YouTube channel. You can find that just by searching for C.C. Meller Library on YouTube. It will also be up on Facebook um, immediately afterwards since we've been live. It will just be, you can see the recording straight away. So um, if you know someone who would have enjoyed this, please share it with them. Um, you know, it's the, the beauty of the internet and, and asynchronous events. Um, so please feel free to, to send that out to all of the poetry lovers in your life. 
Um, and uh, one last thing, uh, the library is uh, more dependent on donations than ever because of the, the difficult times we find ourselves in. Um, so if you enjoyed this program, if you want to see us do more programs like this, um, if you support the work of libraries in general, um, go to ccmillerlibrary.org slash donate. Um, it is a, a, never a bad time. Uh, no gift is too small. We are always appreciative um, for any support that you guys can toss our way. Um, and if you uh, or anyone you know would like to do a reading, let me know. I love doing these. They're super fun. <laughs> so uh, thank you to everyone who read. Again, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close our program out. Um, and I hope everyone has a really lovely evening. Bye, everybody.